So hello, everybody. We are starting late because of me. I forgot to send the meeting link. So um, which I keep doing a lot when I try to inv invite someone on. But uh, how you guys doing? I'm here with Tom and Zhao. Zhao, you know, from the podcast, Tom, you know, we've done things yeah. together. Yeah, usually on my channel. <laughs> usually the other way around. So, um, you know, this is a topic that's been on my mind for a while off and on. Um, but we're going to talk about content ownership or the lack thereof. And I figured what we could do is kind of, before we get started, just obviously we could say a little bit about ourselves, but it's more like, you know, what is, how do you consume media and how does the current uh, situation affect you? We'll get more into the situation, but like, so starting with you, Tom, like, like how is your, like what kinds of content, digital content do you use? Where do you use it? That kind of thing. Well, when I'm not creating digital content, the stuff that I consume, right. yeah, <laughs> consuming, yeah, which is funny. We just talked about this uh, in our other show with Wendell, where he said, you know, for a minute, just a few moments, there was this time and place where streaming services seemed to satisfy our needs and they were inexpensive and they had this laziness factor for a few dollars a month. But since mm -hmm. uh, the lawyers got involved and the, the people that change things, it's now more expensive than I think it used to be to have cable. The experience is worse because even though you're paying more for it, you still have ads. So I've definitely dusted off the old um, over the last couple of years and dusted off the old self-hosted fully in on media streaming. Now, I thought it was cool when Google Music let me upload all of the maybe more unique music that I have that was not necessarily generally available and you could play it through their service. I thought that was just kind of neat. So I always kept my copies of it. And then slowly I started liking other artists. And then I realized when you stop liking those service, I suddenly don't have access to those artists. So I've now curated again. Um, and people ask me why I chose MB because everyone, you know, it's it's the argument of which one you should use, Plex or MB. Well, Plex broke right. in a way I couldn't figure out. I couldn't make it work on my TV, I should say. It played only on the app. And I said, well, I want to play on my TV. I loaded MB. It played on my TV. I stopped looking. I know there's other options out there. But the, this one played on my TV and had an app on my Chromecast. So now all my local media is in MB, both my music and all my videos, and it works wonderfully. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a, quite a popular solution, which I'm sure we'll talk more about here shortly. So, Zhao, how do you consume media? Well, let's just say I have the original, uh, original Star Wars trilogy in like four or five different formats. I have the VHS tapes, I have DVDs, I have Blu-rays. And it just gets annoying after a while to chase the next format. It just gets annoying dealing with the restrictions of why you can't play this on a specific device and you can play the other one, why stuff isn't compatible anymore. And when you add the, the streaming services and their end user license agreements that take over an hour to read from point to point and have all these funny clauses that say that they can take away the stuff that's yours um, without any notice, um then yeah i use plex so yeah. <laughs> basically all of that pushed me to using plex obviously just the stuff that i own of course we're not condoning anything else but um it's the convenience of it uh, and when you start throwing too many things in front of the convenience people start looking for alternatives yeah that, that's a yeah that's a good point there's lots of good points here so for me there's several different things so um, music, TV, movies, games, you know, pretty much all of them, you know, the, the, all the things you can consume. I consume some content from every category. And I include games here because we, we suffer maybe not exactly the same environment, but we do have restrictions. And, you know, we have comments from executives lately saying that you don't own your games and people need to get used to it, which called, caused some fallout. But for me, I use Plex. I use Plexamp for music and, and Plex itself for movies and TV. I use Plex because I'm using, I, I've already set it up and I do feel that it's only a matter of time before Plex crosses the line in some way. And they've come close already to where I just drop them. But right now they work. I don't really have any reason to justify changing to a new server. It's a workload. I have content to create, but Plex works for now. And when it comes to games, I collect retro games. So I'm not just ROMs. I have a collection of ROMs, yes, but I have the physical games. And we'll, we'll talk later. There's some challenges with, you know, classic games that emulation helps you solve. And this is kind of um, overlapping in a way because you have a, you know, 
digital copy of a game and there's uh, legal gray areas there. But at the same time, as we go full circle back to the content companies, um, it started for me just like it did most people. You know, I, it, it seemed like at one point it was Netflix and Hulu. You had those two things. You know, I told people that, you know, we're new to streaming video, like which one should I go with? I say, we'll go with both. One is good for TV. The other is good for movies. It was true at the time, not so much now. Um, and it was like, you know, what? $15 for the two, maybe $20 when a cable bill is over 100 So obviously the cord cutting movement um, was there so we could save money off our cable bill just for all these streaming services to add up to the point where the bill is pretty much the same as it was when we had cable, which is putting us where we are. But then we have situations where we have content in the cloud, so to speak. I don't want to, have to call it the cloud because this whole thing predated the term cloud. We had content we could stream. And it's convenient, like Joe was saying, we could just, you know, turn on a device and just choose something to watch and watch it. And now it's just not that simple. I'm I'm driving with the kids and I'm telling them there, there's this tool song that you have to hear. It's like really, really awesome. We gotta listen to the song. And the album's gone. And okay, fine. And I didn't, I wasn't able to play it that day. Probably lost an agreement or something. And then, you know, you have TV shows that are taken off of Netflix, which you could kind of understand because you're not buying it, you're using the service. But when you have something like recently Sony, where you're buying a license to watch something whenever you want, and they take it away. And one of the and the one of the first things I'll mention about this is that when you and everyone has done or watched a video online, they know this. You go online, you pick a movie, you have a couple options. You can rent it. You can watch an SD version or an HD version. So you have a few things. And you can save a little bit of money if you're hard up. Uh, just watch the SD version, save a few bucks on the HD version. But you could then watch it whenever you want, unless you rent it. Then you have it for like 48 hours. They take away your rights, which is fine. You could, you could take away my rights if I rent, rented it. But when you get to a situation where you have put a lot of money down on one of these platforms to own something in air quotes, they market it like you own it. You know, in the verbiage, the marketing, they sell it as you are owning it. You can rent it or own it. There's a distinction, right? We buy VHS tapes. We could either own the VHS tape. We think we're only going to watch the movie once back in the day. We rented it. We had a choice. We either own it or we don't. And when it translates to digital content, you know, in the end user license agreement, it might say on the screen, you'll own it for $20 and watch it whenever you want, asterisk, as long as it's convenient for the company. And then what happens when they take it away? Well, lately, nothing. You know, late, lately we've had Sony basically tell people that their entire content collection and all the money they put down on it, that is gone. And what was everyone's reaction? Did they, um, you know, have pitchforks and yell and put up a fuss? No, it's okay. That's fine. It's fine. You just take it away. We understand. We don't know this. What? No, <laughs> we need to really, as long as we keep being complacent about these things, then they're going to keep happening. And then we have topics like how to rip your own media. What do you do if you wanted to take this in, into your own hands? So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so I figure we could talk about why we feel that these content companies are not good stewards of our uh, media collection. And then I think from there, the talk will probably just uh, hmm. navigate itself. <laughs> You know, we I mentioned this because we uh, had, had talked about it prior to in Corey Doctor had a really good post that if buying isn't owning, piracy isn't stealing. And he's right. been a long time creator that I've followed, creates a lot of books and a lot of wonderful content. And it really fights the system because once you install DRM, you have surrendered your rights. You've you've bought into a broken system that puts you at the mercy of those selling it to you. I've been a massive anti DRM person as far as I can remember. Like this is something that right. drives me crazy and people just don't necessarily, especially if you're newer to consuming the media, you know, cause the transition from like Joe had said from DVDs and other media formats to digital, people just kind of assume the same level of apply uh, was there like, Oh yeah, cool. I, I own this. I can watch it anytime. Oh, it just happens to be in their server, but I can watch it anytime. And we've realized it's not, and it's been right really disheartening and i think that's why people they don't know who to be mad at because being mad at sony is hard and right. actually taking sony to court as an individual because i lost my uh digital copy of some media that i like is hard 
getting class action against it is harder. Getting congressional action against it when generally they favor these large companies is wildly hard, especially because it has to be done at a federal level. And we haven't right. seen any federal rule change since 1988 here in the United States that actually was for consumer rights. The last one was actually regarding the ability for people to get your list of rented movies from movie rental stores in 1988. That was the last time we had an effective federal level law passed. That's a long time ago, and that law now um, didn't really translate well to current media status, and the video stores don't really translate to anything anymore. They're pretty much gone, so you know we don't have the rental stores anymore. They all just in our heads, it all just moved online, but we haven't had any real effective change in it that would fix these rights management problems that we have. And it is kind of like you said, the status quo where people are kind of accepting of it, but I think it's less that they're accepting; it's more they don't know how to gather around and fight this system. Like right. they don't know how to do it. And honestly, you know, besides um, writing my congressperson about it, I'm not exactly sure how to get them to care about it. We're still trying to get them to stop suing us off of all the allegedly use of IP addresses for things that, that whole, that lawsuit that went on for years with all these companies of them misidentifying people. Like they kept the courts tied up for a long time. and we felt no progress was made. It took a long time for they realized one, it was just yeah. ineffective. Um, it wasn't finding, it wasn't getting the prosecutions they wanted, but it was also like burdening up the system. I think the court system finally had had enough of it too going, all right, we're busy with dumb and, and the dumb is yeah. now pushed by the music industry um, and everything else. It's not, this isn't a tenable solution. You can't just throw it all in the courts and say, fix it. And these are all bad people. No, we're not. We're just trying to consume the media that we don't mind giving you money for. And also, we have to keep in mind that the, the the technical knowledge of a lot of the people in power, I could describe it and summarize it by just simply saying they still use MapQuest as a verb. Yeah, all I got to say. <laughs> and, and those are the ones that are making decisions or deciding that they that something's important to look at or not or whatever it is in politics. We're not. I mean, it's impossible not to get into politics when you're talking about stuff like this because the lack of, um, you know putting holding people to the fire when you know if i have my money in something i want to know that it's there like if i buy a blu-ray if i step on it and crack it that's my fault it's you know what i need to go and replace it i'm a klutz if i lose it i lose it but if i if i'm having someone else hang on to it for me it's their responsibility to keep it for me but when their agreement says that they'll keep it for me unless they don't feel like it well that doesn't make me feel too good with my investment and yeah. that's kind of where we are in it's it's sorry it, it's actually a distortion of the the physical activities the the change to to online and to digital copies of stuff it's basically a translation of going to the store and purchasing something and having it available online like tom was saying it's mm -hmm. somewhere and you can just watch it when you want um the thing is we are now in a in an environment, in a zeitgeist, the, the current generation never had that experience of going to to Blockbuster and renting a movie and taking it home and having it for 48 hours and then returning it or having overcharges or something like that. That rewinding. And, and, <laughs> and rewinding your tapes. Yes, yes, do rewind your tapes. And that experience has been lost. We've done it when we were younger, but there is this disconnect now between what's expected of the same activity when it was changed to digital from what happened when it was actually something physical. And yep. it's not so much that people are getting used to it. People never experienced the, uh, the other side. People didn't experience it when it was different. So this is what they are being told is the norm, and this is what they are actually doing. To your point before, what you were saying about that law in 88, wasn't that the law that they passed because some people in Congress didn't like seeing their VCR rental lists being yes. leaked to the press? Yeah. That's the yes. one, right? Yeah. Yeah. To, to add a little bit of context for uh, maybe the younger audience, uh, you could actually go and ask for at these rental stores, not just the latest movies that come out, but perhaps some... Uh, R-rated things that were always in a back room. And then right. people were using these lists to embarrass Congress people, which so the Congress people were not acting necessarily on behalf of all of us constituents. They had a real personal concern that people would know their viewing history and that bothered them a lot. <laughs> it makes so them act need... faster, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. And maybe we just need to leak uh who's watching uh Sex in the City movies or something and just see it just as an example and just see how that see how fast we get regulation then. So 
some of the things that, um, you know, I, I really like digital copies, you know, when you strip all this away, because when I look at retro games, you know, people might think, well, what's the big deal? You have the physical copies. It's if you only have a few minutes to play a game after a hard day is worth the work, you're, you don't, you don't have time to set up an emulator and all these things or to set up a game system, whatever one's easier, you're going to go with that. Emulators are usually easier because you, you don't have to worry about your save battery being dead or the fact that you uh, need to get an alcohol wipe because your Sega CD won't connect to the, the Sega Genesis and all these other things that, that you run into. And, you know, emulation saves us from that. But not only that, these games, they, they can die. They could be lost forever, you know, because if, especially if the company went out of business, they're gone. How do we enjoy it then? Um, so digital copies kind of put us in control. And going back to movies, you know, my movie collection... Literally, I started hosting movies for this reason. I come home from work and I find my son, who at the time is, you know, younger than one. He's uh, playing with all the DVDs. He has them out of the case and he's just running them over the carpet, you know, getting them all there, nice and scratched up. So I'm like, OK, I need to digitize all of these. And at that point, OK, I have a digital copy of all these, but I'm in control. I can, you know, at that point. You know, Netflix, Hulu was the most we had and we had a Plex server, but now it's just so much more complicated because if you don't take ownership of this yourself, then you're giving control to people who just aren't qualified and are incompetent when it comes to keeping these things for us. They're incompetent because they can be. It's not because they don't know how to do a better job. It's not because, you know, they're not smart. I'm sure they're brilliant, but unless they're required to do something, they're not going to. And if they can have an asterisk that lets them delete whatever, whenever, sure, why not? If nobody's complaining, then why not do it? And then there's that, a, here we are. There's an important cultural aspect to this as well. We're losing part of the culture. Last year, um, Disney came out with a movie called Crater. If you haven't seen it, tough luck, it's no longer available anywhere. Five, week, five weeks after being on Disney+, Plus, it was pulled out. There's no Is legitimate... <laughs> it cratered at the yeah. box office. <laughs> um, but again, imagine five, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years from now, some of the, the actors there make it big and they're in all the blockbusters at the time. And you went to take a look back at their career, how they started, how they first got their, their first roles, what they were, how they improved over time. And you will not be able to do that because simply that piece of culture is no longer available anywhere. Right. And and that's a problem. And this affects movies, this affects TV shows, this affects games as well. And we're losing pieces of our culture because preserving that, it's really important. And it's really hard to do when you have to fight the people who created it in the first place. And, and that's tricky to, to maintain the situation. And it's so weird sometimes where you have somebody who takes a clip of a trailer. So obviously a movie's coming out. Trailer's out. Everybody's talking about it. Can't wait for this movie. And there's reaction videos. Someone puts a clip of the of it in there. They get taken down because they have a, just like five seconds of it. But they're just talking about it. it. It's like they don't even want free publicity. That's what it is. It's free publicity. They're talking about your movie. They're, they might get somebody excited about it, but they're so like prehistoric with the way they think about these things that it's just it's just awkward. Like like it, it doesn't even make tangible sense because until this happened, we felt a sense of ownership. We bought a VHS tape DVD, we own it, but now it's like, we got to take control, but how do we do that? How do we get people excited? We talk about legislation, great. If that happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it probably won't. So then all we're left with is us. And I, one of the reasons why I started this live stream is because I just want to raise awareness for this. And maybe other YouTubers will talk about it. Maybe other people will make videos about it. Jeff Gerling already made a video about this and was part of the inspiration for this one. So is there anything else you guys can think of? Like, like, what do we do? Do we just exist in this world? Can we, I mean, we already established that people don't know who to complain to. <laughs> so what do we do? Um, you know, one of the reasons I kickstarted, backed on Kickstarter, both of Cory Doctorow's books around this topic um, was to help raise awareness. Um, not only because I wanted to read the book, raise awareness about it, about the Kickstarter. And one of the things in why I push a lot of people towards this book is a lot of people complain and don't really tell you what to do. One of the things that I've enjoyed about uh, 
his book, especially one of them called Choke Point Capitalism, where he talks about this a lot, is he calls them shovel ready solutions. There are things you can do. So the book is um, the first uh, 80% of the book, let's say, is you getting really angry and feeling like the world is collapsing in because of how bad these media companies are. The good news is the last couple chapters tells you something to do about it and kind of some action items. And it it is a heavy lift, but it is calling. And if there's enough push, if we work together towards a common good of fighting with our Congress critters and telling them that they need to pass laws on our behalf and we have to actually engage them and not just email them, that, that is the easiest. Right. It, it is the easiest for us and it's also the easiest for them to ignore. If you take the time to actually engage, call, and of course vote, you can get towards better BD solutions. We're currently seeing a lot of changes come out of the FTC. They're actually going after Amazon for some pretty unscrupulous behavior that they've been getting with for a long time. We're watching them slow down some of the mergers that are happening in the tech space, if you will, and maybe a little bit outside of it as well, that they're finally getting that wrangled in. It's not easy. It's years and years of abuse and turning that uh, Leah Khan, current head of the FTC, is turning that around. Uh, and it's because, you know, we encourage and engage with those that we're seeing changes, but they do come slowly. Um, this was a slow march towards where we're at, and it's not going to be a overnight flip the switch to get back to where we kind of should be or where we want to be with digital rights management and ownership of our media. So I this podcast, us being here at this time, is one more push towards it. I think that's uh, definitely all steps in the right direction. They, in the moment, you never know you're experiencing history, but you always look back and go, "Wait, oh cool, we did change something." <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. It's hard to it's hard to see incremental change while it's going on. Just in much the same way, you you look at our YouTube channels, like watch a video. Don't do this, but watch a video near to the time we we first started. Compare it to a recent one, and you'll see incremental yeah. the results of incremental change real quick. But um, so, so Chow, how about you? How does this impact you? Like, if you had situations where you're just sitting down to watch something with your family and then just all of a sudden found out you can't or worse? Well, for starters, it would annoy me very much. Then I would immediately look to my offline collection to see if I happen to have a copy of it. And I mean, look, the companies will do what companies will do. They'll try to get their profits up. They'll try to make, to extort the most amount of profit from whatever situation they're in. Um, and they're enjoying this moment in the sun until people start to push back. And like Tom was saying, this only happens for as long as you let them have the, this continues to happen. And you can always try and do something about it. Um, yep. Again, it's, it's tough to reconcile some of the stuff that happens in the US that then gets translated to us not in the US. Um, for example, Netflix started as a DVD rental company. They weren't transmitting digital stuff over the network. They were renting DVDs to people and you would return the DVDs. They would give you the envelope to send them back, right? Oh yeah, um, I, had, I had a subscription to that. And that's a completely different experience from what you have right now. So when you have services like Amazon with Prime that they will try to push it your way every single time that they can advertise it to you, uh, all the way if you're buying a toothpick, they will try to get you to, to Prime and to subscribe to Prime and to get video and all of that. And then you do it and then it's convenient and all of that. But all the while that this com all the time that these companies are throwing hurdles your way and they're making your experience less enjoyable by removing stuff they're pushing you the other way and we saw with napster how this goes people will always prefer convenience and it was more convenient when napster came out to get mp3s that way than it was because there was no competing service and then apple understood it and came out with itunes which let you do the same yep. thing i'm glad you and brought that brought that up um you know it's just it, it's appalling but we allow this to happen you know like i said we don't some people don't know that they that there's a, another way that it is what it is but you know people like us like you're saying we could just uh bang the drum and if enough people do it um but but you brought up um basically an offline collection so obviously piracy is is always going to enter into a conversation like this one and I'm not condoning unauthorized duplication. I'll never call it stealing, okay? Unauthorized copying, yes, okay? You're not taking a physical object. There's a difference. But what companies have, but I'm still not con condoning whatever, but um, companies have to realize that, you know, emulation and piracy 
that's their biggest competitor. It's not us sharing a movie with a friend, okay? That's not going to hurt them. Their competition is, is piracy. And it's not competition that can be defeated because the only thing that could defeat piracy is you make it so easy that even the pirates want to go that direction, okay? If you can make it that easy that even the pirates want to go that direction, um, then, then you know that it's something that could work. But that's who you're competing with. Nintendo is competing with this. You, you've heard of ROM sites being taken down. Um, th this kind of thing happens. But that's who they're competing with. And if they don't have a solution for the public, that's why we have things like Plex, MB, Emulation, RetroPie, all these different things. Because we're solving a problem that the companies themselves should be solving. But they're so caught up with fighting their paying customers. Let's, let's put this in perspective. They're so caught up fighting their paying customers that they barely go after, you know, the piracy thing. It's, it's created to, you know, prevent piracy, prevent duplication. But what, you know, another losing battle they're fighting is there's always going to be someone that knows a way around it and still is able to copy it. And my favorite story, I forgot what year this was, but it was a Celine Dion album that came out. It had copy protection on the CD. Sony spent a ridiculous amount of money making this technology. And what would happen is you put, put this, the Celine Dion album that just came out at the time in a CD player is fine. It plays whatever. Put it in a computer, it doesn't work. Okay. What someone found out was that the only reason why it doesn't work in a computer CD player is because the first track is junk. Now, a CD player, an audio CD player, like the kind in your car, for example, will just skip the junk track and, and play what's actually the first track. And, and that... So basically it caused like a, the CD-ROM drive to loop. So if someone found out, they got a Sharpie, they drew a ring around the CD over the track that had the junk data. And guess what? This, the computer reads it just fine. So somebody thwarted, you know, millions of dollars in R&D and a copy protection service, you know, with a Sharpie, okay? That's who these people are going against. We're, you know, the IT people find solutions to things and we're gonna, it might just be a matter of time. We broke DVD encryption, um, and again, I'm not advocating for anyone to break the law. All I'm saying is that that's who these people are competing with. Even I had someone tell me once, and, and I was okay with this. They said, they literally told me they pirated my book. I literally had somebody tell me that. And you know what? Good for you. Because they weren't going to buy it anyway. Yeah. I was never going to get their sale. Okay. That, that individual, and this is why I didn't get mad. They read my book. That's the point. I want them to read it. Number one. Okay. But if they didn't have a way to pirate it, if it was impossible to, to grab a copy of it without paying, um, they would not have bought it. Okay. Cause when someone, some people decide they want something for free, they just want it for free at that point. It's a trophy. It, you know, they may or may not watch that movie. How many of us go through our, every game in our steam collection? Nobody. How many people have watched every movie in our, on our Plex server? Nobody. Okay. Unless you just started creating it. Nobody. We amassed this huge collection and what we i think we need in the industry is more accessibility to the content like imagine if nintendo comes out with a new system which they're going to any time now rumor is they'll announce it this month or next we don't know what's going to be but if they had like a i hate to use itunes but uh, i will an itunes like service that actually had content ownership where you had you could buy the older games and play them and you had some kind of guarantee that the next nintendo system all of your purchases will transfer in some kind of um, responsibility, but we don't have that. But imagine how well that would do because they're solving a problem that the emulation community is solving. And, and that's what they're up against. And it's not all companies that go down this route. Uh, Steam, like you mentioned, Steam actually does this better than the competition, at least in my view. If you buy a game and for some reason they decide to stop selling that game, you still have it in your collection. You can mm -hmm. still download it and you can still install it. Um, if you do that on Amazon and you buy a movie and they decide to remove it for whatever reason they remove it, then you lose access to it completely. And, and that's a small but significant difference there. Steam actually removed some of the hurdles of the process. Steam makes it this convenient or easy enough to compete with piracy in that aspect. And they made a, com a very successful business model on top of that. So it's not impossible to deliver a good quality service that doesn't hurt your customers. Right. Yep. And, yeah, and that is the challenge I think a lot of people don't realize is it can be done. There are people doing it. You know, I've uh, 
see other you know, steam and you know to just kind of re- reference back like with Corey doctor one of the things that he has done a great job of is to have a successful book career without using amazon uh he has one book legitimately one book on amazon called why i don't publish on amazon <laughs> I think is great, but he also faces the problem of companies copying his books and putting them on Amazon to sell them, even though they're not sanctioned by him. It's a, it's a never ending cycle of takedown notices he has because of the popularity of his books. It can be done. It's just not easy to do, especially, you know, when Amazon is consuming all the different media companies, we're conglomerating them all into one, making this a bigger, bigger challenge. Gaming companies are kind of the same way. Steam is definitely the big shining light of user and consumer friendliness. But unfortunately we were watching on a back end game companies, whether they're being swallowed by Microsoft directly or indirectly with other companies. Um, and then they use that power to see how much more they can fight with us. Yeah. And you bring up steam. It's kind of interesting. I can give you an example. I don't know if this has ever been resolved, but last time I looked at it, uh, you can't buy mortal Kombat nine on steam. You can't, you cannot buy that game. Uh, literally a numbered entry in the mortal Kombat series. You cannot buy on steam because they had guest characters in there and I guess they lost the rights for, I don't know if it's Freddy Krueger or one of the other characters in there. So now the whole game is removed from Steam, but since I bought it beforehand, then of course, like I was mentioning, I can download it and install it and still enjoy it, but um, because it's better than anything that came out after it, but that's just my opinion. (laughs) But um, anyway, but the point is, I mean, yeah, I agree that that's, that's reasonable. And I think that's what we're looking for is just for companies to be reasonable. If I pay for it, I don't care if you stop selling it to other people, but at least give it to the people that paid for it. And that's, I thought at one point, Sony was doing a decent job a long time ago, kind of, because I bought Mortal Kombat 2 for the PlayStation 3. I'm a big fan of the series, if you didn't already know. And it was a great port of the game and they stopped selling it for whatever reason, but I could still download it. I could still get it on my system. And um, nowadays it's, you know, they were in the news recently for taking away everyone's movie collection and video collection. So, you know, I guess I can't say that about them anymore. So what do, so P- Plex and MB, I can't really speak on MB, but do we want to cover like pros, like a high level pros and cons of some of the solutions out there that people can look at if they wanted to kind of just, you know, play around with owning their media? I mean, we could start with Plex. I, I yeah, love that someone mentioned we because we were talking about the reference of learning what your video history was from the movie stores and the movie rental stores. Uh, yeah. If I recall correctly, from and was reminded by the comments in the stream, didn't Plex do that too? Thought they would let you know what you were doing and share that with other people, which I yeah. thought was a little weird. With your family, even. Yeah. <laughs> that's, happened, that's happened to me. There, there's been a number of things. And to be fair, Plex is under a microscope because they're, they're a company. And obviously, community services I'm going to favor because it's harder for the community. Not impossible, but harder for the community to make a decision like this. But um, So Plex started, it was simply just hosting your movies and later music, whatever. But then later on, they started doing some things that had some people a little um, in a tizzy. So at one point, it's like they have movie trailers uh, all over the main screen. Not trailers for movies that you own, but movies that you might be into. Now, I can be kind of okay with that. I could shut that off. It, it's in the settings. But what makes people annoyed is that they didn't turn it on in the first place. They're an existing user, and now they have some some stuff on their front page. They don't know why it's there, so I have to Google it. Why do I have trailers all over my screen? And, and then next thing I know, um, I see one of my kids watching a movie. And not not a bad one. It was fine, but it wasn't a movie that I owned or that I ripped. It was some cartoon or whatever. I'm like, okay, they, they found a cartoon. Come to, or, or I don't know if it's a cartoon. And, but the point is, they're putting movies on Plex that you don't own mixed in with the ones that you do own. And, you know, so far, none of this is removing your rights. But there was a situation where I think they did lock somebody out of their account. So they're they're getting really close to the line and they're dancing on it. So in my opinion, that's the issue with Plex. I can't recommend it because it does work. And again, I use it, but I only use it because I haven't changed. And if I was going to do it over, I wouldn't have trust for Plex because I feel like they can go to the next level and then um, the situation can be worse. So that's one thing to think about with these services is like who owns it who runs it um is it open source is it community run i think those are some important factors because you could create the same situation in plex let's be honest if they decide to lock you out of your content because the motion picture association decides that they're a piracy company which they probably could 
So just keep that in mind. But another one I really like and I want to recommend to a lot of people is Volumio. Um, it's a Raspberry Pi project. And I'm sure there's others like this. It essentially this lets you serve your music collection via your network. So somebody can just go to a, a web console, type in you know your Raspberry Pi's IP address, click on something to play, and you have speakers plugged in your Raspberry Pi, you got a jukebox. It's pretty cool. Um, and I think there's apps to hook it into your car and things. There's all these different services. But the thing is, when companies own this, you know, we don't own anything. They just own the rights to give us the privilege to watch it until it's no longer in their fancy to do so. And I feel like we need some of that control back. And that's where we're they're, at. They're redefining words. They're redefining the meaning of words. And they're right. memory holding stuff. So buy doesn't mean buy. It means rent. But they want to market it as if it was still buy. And when you fall into that trap, then if you accept that, you accept everything that comes after. And the thing with Plex, and I've been a user of Plex for a long time. I bought the Lifetime Pass when it was way cheaper than it is right now. And that's why I continue to use it. I already paid for it. Um, um, that too. Yep. But I want to play a bit of devil's advocate here on, on Plex side. Plex is always skirting the line because they also don't want to be sued by the, the copyright companies because they're facilitating piracy. So they can never appear to be just a facilitator of offline collections and all of that. That's why they've been over the years. Again, mm. That's why they've been, in my opinion, I have no insider knowledge of Plex why they are providing services and working closer with uh, with rights holders uh, into providing the TV and shows that they do provide and providing the movies that are out of copyright that they can distribute on their service as well. And in a way to get closer to the copyright holders uh, in order to avoid being sued by them. Uh, so you think so there's, it's just for, for them to be in the good graces of the company? Yeah. They're just kind of doing this for that. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. That, that could be the case very much they so. They all have a tightrope to watch because it's if they get on the bad side of these media companies. I mean, we're watching Sony, who thankfully lost, but they sued Quad Nine, a DNS company, for resolving domains that they think are related to companies that would also infringe on a copyright. I mean, this is quite the reach, uh, in my opinion. And thankfully, the court's seen the logic or illogic in Sony's argument and saying. No, companies who resolve domain names are not the ones responsible. You have to work on getting these domains shut down if you feel there's a need to. But of course, Sony uh, found a lot of trouble in doing that. So they said, hey, let's just go after the DNS companies, hoping to get some case precedent set, I'm assuming, to say, hey, let's go after more. So it's it's one of those things like how far will these companies go? Their pockets are clearly really deep because that, that hit some – there was a, quite a bit of hoopla over there in – I believe it was in – uh, it started in Germany or was it ended in Sweden? I'm trying to remember the lawsuit actually. It, it was confusing to me because um, I don't understand all the European laws much. It's a little different than how it works in the US, but it was a mess. And the bottom line is Sony thought suing DNS was the solution to try to stop piracy. That's how far they're willing to go. <laughs> it's always DNS, right? It's always DNS. <laughs> even when it's DNS, lawyers. DNS fails and so does the lawsuit against DNS, rightfully yeah. so. No matter what is involved with DNS, it'll fail. So... Yeah, so Sony's been, uh, that doesn't surprise me. And the fact that that, I didn't know about that. The fact that it didn't surprise me tells you everything. It's like, yeah, of course they did. Like, of course they the only did. thing that I think is surprising is that Nintendo didn't sue RetroPie or come after the RetroPie. Even though RetroPie doesn't contain anything, you know, any intellectual property, it is a means to play older games. And, you know, obviously they can argue, well, it's just for homebrew or something. But, you know, I'm surprised Nintendo didn't go after them. And so, it's one thing we're, we're solving problems that companies themselves aren't good at. And the companies sue us for trying to solve problems and bringing things to the market that they should have brought to the market long ago. Like maybe they should just join us. If Flex wants to join the motion picture association or whatever, and have trailers all over to be in their good graces, then, you know, we need someone to do the right thing in the other regard too. So um, I'm not sure the way forward is altogether. Like, I'm, I don't know if I'll have tutorials on some of these things. Maybe I will. Um, but I thought, like, at the very least, you know, this live stream is going to be a good start. And I really hope other people follow suit, too, because we really do need to just shine the light on this. But I think another thing is to educate people nicely, right? We don't want to try to be too uh, aggressive with this. But just, you know, let people know, you know, if you're buying that movie, eh, you might not have it in a year. Uh, just keep that in mind, you know, and just, just, 
anytime you're you're talking about this, you know, I'm not going to defend these companies. I'm going to say, yeah, if you, you want to lose it eventually, yeah, sure. Just buy it online. Otherwise, just go to Best Buy and now go to the Blu-ray section, which is now just like one half of a, no, it's like a quarter of a shelf on a, at like the very end of, I mean, it's, it's small, but they exist. And the unfortunate thing here is, I hope I'm wrong, but I think 4K Blu-ray might very well be the last format we all ever have. I mean, are they coming out with a replacement? I don't think they will, like because they don't they want everything to be streaming. They probably don't want a replacement. They want the control, so they probably won't introduce a competitor to Blu-ray either. So, but and Netflix knows? and Netflix doesn't let you download the 4K version, right? Uh, Netflix I, I, has 4K. Well, you can't download or do they have download now i guess that shows so much i no, watch tv see i'm more of a video game person so that's why i'm the emulation yeah. side of things none but, of them legit um, i should say have download yeah. the reality is you're viewing media there you there, can always yeah there's there's a there's a technology here that will allow us to do it we'll just say that. oh there there is i thought you were talking about the ability to cache content like on your ipad or your tablet uh, when yeah. you're out driving and i mean they do have that don't have a connection because i just didn't know but that's Still, I bet a lot of companies don't want to give you that ability because they're afraid you're going to break well, their encryption. And you know. interestingly, one of the ways, uh, one of the challenges as well that Netflix ran into, there was Netflix is actually very public facing in terms of their big supporter, big contributor to BSD. They're very open about how the technology on the back end works. But I remember one of the talks they gave a long time ago of how they don't do some things in a most rational way for how they distribute media because they have to comply with the way all the movie rights holders want them to distribute the media. So they're like, oh, there's more efficient ways we could do this, but we can't do them those ways because, you know, right. these are the problems we run into. Here's the legal problems. Here's what the lawyers get involved. So even though the technical and correct solution would be to do it in this particular method, uh, it was some of the way they do the streams. It's the way they have to validate the streams and add extra overhead to encryption. So these little silly things that the, basically the lawyers made them put in, uh, which of course, these are they've given talks at open source events, which makes it fun because they're like, here's how I want to do it, but here's how the lawyers maybe do it. <laughs> yep, and yeah, that's lawyers. That uh that's how you yeah. how some go south. That that's actually a point that you guys are not subject to on the US, but on the other markets it really touches on a lot of nerves. When a movie comes out in the US, it comes out at the a given date so on this date it's a premiere it comes out on the movies or it comes out on streaming or whatever on other markets it might come out three weeks after that it might come out a month after that it might come out three months after that whenever it's distributed on those countries so in a world like we have right now where you can transfer a movie file in a, a couple of minutes a couple of seconds you have mm -hmm. to wait a couple of months to see the latest blockbuster to see the latest episode of star wars for example and yeah, I don't want to say they're shooting themselves in the foot, but they really are shooting themselves with the foot with a really large rifle at that point. Because, <laughs> yeah, if I have to wait two months to see that great movie that I'm all hyped up for, or I can download it in two minutes and see it after that, yeah, the scales don't line up that well. Well, yeah. there's been an argument for a long time that I've seen some of the younger directors really push for. They said, you know, you spend all this money marketing to get people to the theater. And then you have to revamp the marketing campaign to get it in homes. And a lot of the creators are going, why don't we just have a simul release? And they also kind of include the other country problem going, we could save the marketing budget because we could just do one big push to say, everyone watch this, watch this on your terms, watch this now in Europe, watch this in Australia, watch this in the US. Hey, by the way, watch it at home, watch it at the theater, uh, whatever, watch it, just watch it. That's what our goal. And consume it all at once with one hit. Now the movie's good or not, you don't know because it's all coming out. And this sometimes probably hurts the sales later. If the movie's not very good, I may not want to buy the DVD. But on day one, if I'm hyped up enough, there's a chance I'm going to waste the money on it because I bought into the hype. I bought into your ad hype. I didn't have, no, I don't have anyone telling me, oh, I went to the theater. It was terrible. Don't, don't bother. Oh, that's too bad. I might've done it. And then it comes up again. I'm like, oh yeah, my friend who went to the theater and I don't like theaters, uh, they said it was terrible. So now I'm never going to watch it. <laughs> I'm not yeah, going to say Sony want. Marvel movies, but Sony Marvel movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, they have such a such a tight grip on things. I mean, you can't break the street date or else. I mean, I literally found a game on the shelf. I was I couldn't wait for this game to come out. And it was a week before release. I grabbed that game. I took it up to the cash register. Can't have it. Darn it. Um, movies can't break street dates. They have NDAs for reviews up until like the time the movie comes out. 
and they go after YouTube videos that have clips of things in it because they don't like free publicity. They, you know, it's, I can understand wanting to be paid for a service. I can understand the writers, the producers, the actors, everybody needs to be compensated for the great work that they do. But this is not required to protect them. They're not helping anyone. People are still going to rip that Blu-ray. They're still going to eventually unencrypt whatever it is they encrypt. It's just a matter of time. Even if we can't do it today, we might be able to do it tomorrow. And that's what they're fighting against. And instead, they're just going against people that are just telling their friend about a movie or maybe, um, I mean, because literally if, if they could stop you from letting a friend borrow a Blu-ray, they would do it. And I guarantee they would. And if there's ads on Netflix or whatever other service and they could get away with disabling the mute button on your device, I guarantee you <laughs> they would absolutely disable the volume control on your phone if they get the notion that they can get away with it. That's who we're up against. And that's ex and I, I, I stand firm on that. One day they're going to try it. Mute, you know, you're going to save money on this phone, but you can't turn off the volume. <laughs> Got to hear those ads. I don't know if you guys saw this story, but one of the arguments that they use about digital copies versus physical is that uh, the digital copies actually reduces the, the theft, the in-store theft. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was this story running about this shop. It was in the US where they had this small shelf with Blu-rays and every now and then the, the employees would notice that there would be less and less Blu-rays there, but they weren't selling actually any Blu-rays at all. So they went over and they looked at the, the footage that they had, the CCTV footage, and they noticed that and they realized that, yeah, but people can actually mail stuff out while they're in the store because we oh, have this right in the UK, in yes. This was also a similar one in the in the US. So people were picking up the, the Blu-rays from the shelf, mailing them to themselves, sending the, the post the, the posted straight from the store. They would never go through the aisle. And they were getting the DVDs outside like that. And yeah. In the UK, is... they had to put the mailing supplies at I don't know what store it was, but they had to put yeah. all the mailing supplies in a cage. <laughs> because it just, because they couldn't they never could figure out who's doing it but they you want to buy stamps or envelopes or whatever or whatever i, I don't know if it's stamps in UK, so, something like that yeah you, you couldn't you had to ask for somebody to help you <laughs> Get envelopes. it's always this type of ridiculous arguments that they'll come out with in defense of their business practices and in defense of going digital and reducing theft and all of that it's no, like that you were saying at the at the time piracy is not stealing you're not taking an object and removing the object. You're making a copy of the object. The original one is still there. Nobody touched it. And But they'll go down that rabbit hole and they'll say that you're stealing and you wouldn't download the car and all of that crazy. I would download of course I would. <laughs> Please give me the schematics and the 3D printer and help print You can have like a fancy overnight. car to download more car, like you could download more Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. Um, but, but absolutely. I mean, it's just... I just we need change when when you mess with our leisure time i mean we all work hard we got things going on we want to do what we do at night watch tv listen to music whatever um and now we got to fight executives just to be able to do that and a, a, an album that we can't wait to listen to might not be on the streaming service that we went to onto because it might not be the right choice or maybe it's on a different one next thing you know you have two music streaming services and they love that because now it's like two people or the artist is making money twice but Again, they all need to be paid for the hard work that they do. But when it comes to, you know, theft versus piracy, it, it just boggles my mind that you have some people that will defend angrily that it's stealing and you're screwing them over. I'm sorry, but the media company don't ha doesn't have your back. Why do you have theirs? Like if they could ex like uh, find some way to, to sue you for something content related, believe me, they would. Meanwhile, we just want to enjoy our content. We don't mind paying for it. We understand that these people need to be compensated. It's not about that. We want to pay people for the product without the drama. The drama is great on TV, but drama is not great on the way to get to the TV. You don't want drama to, to watch TV. Drama is <laughs> what happens when, after you press the play button, not before. And and that's what we're dealing with. So I encourage everyone to look into this, just understand. And that's the moral of my side of this. Before you buy something online, understand as best you can 
what's going to happen if that service goes under. In fact, just assume they will. Just assume at some point they're going to pull the plug and take it from you because they probably will eventually. It's just the way it is. It's just a matter of when. And we definitely, at the very minimum, can't trust the, these companies to hold our content for us. But hopefully we could find a positive change in 10 years when we look back at this and say, yeah, it's different now. That's what I'm hoping for. And think about what we're losing as a society if in 50 years, when all of these services have disappeared, we won't be able to go back and look at the media that was available right now. We can look right. at silent movies today that were recorded in the early 20s and in 1910 and something like that, but you won't be able to do that with the latest blockbusters because they were only available online and you won't be able to stream it anymore. The services don't exist. And that's right. a big loss. Yeah. Yeah, it is a piece of our cumulative now. You know, the, the movies and content we consume are a big part of being in the human-driven era that we are, and that will just be like these gaps. Like, you know, this, I can picture some digital archaeologists. Yeah, they have all this garbage stuff that appears to be some robot wrote that's all garbage. I wonder what they watched. Well, companies had this weird belief that they should lock all the content away and somehow it caused it all to go away. So here we are 200 years in the future and we just have this gap of weird content rules that were uh, fought by these unusual companies that ended up not surviving 200 years in the future. <laughs> There's some lost Doctor Who episodes that were recently, the footage yeah. was recently found that somebody had. And, you know, what they want to do, if I, I'm paraphrasing this, but they wanted to, you know, allow people to see it, but they're afraid to, you know, provide it to the media company to make sure it gets to the people or, or something because they think they're going to get sued. So they just keep it in secret. They hoard these lost episodes because um, even for restorative purposes, they're um, they're nervous to have anyone find out that they were holding on to something. And, and for all we know, they could have been the only copies. It might very well be the only copies of those episodes on the planet on one person's hard drive for all we know. I mean, think <laughs> about this for a minute. I mean, that's that's not gonna go well. We know what happens when you have one source of anything. And, and that applies exactly the same to, to gaming as well. The yeah. MMOs that you like to play today won't be around in 20 years, won't be around in 50 years. There's no way you're gonna be doing retro arc emulation of World of Warcraft when Blizzard shuts down. Uh, there's no way to relive that. If you enjoyed World of Warcraft when you were growing up, it, it was a great experience at the time, tough luck. There's no way to go back to that and share that with your kids, your grandkids, or show that, to, oh, this was how we used to do things back then. And, and some people do get these online games to work, but it's not legal. I mean, technically, in the in the license agreement, there's, there's something in there like you shouldn't run your own server. I mean, right now, if you want to run Fantasy Star Online on the Dreamcast, there's a Raspberry Pi solution. To, to get that hooked up to a server and you can you can join up but that that's just luck to your point yeah the, these games will come and go like Final Fantasy 11 for example I haven't played it yet but I beat every numbered entry in the series except for that one if I go around to playing it who knows if the servers will be online anymore I'm surprised they're still online now um it's a really old game like PlayStation 2 era that's still supported and it's still running today but for how much longer? Eventually, it's going to be the one Final Fantasy game that nobody can play. And then 14 will follow suit probably 10 years later when they have a new online game. So to your point, yeah, you want to enjoy these experiences, but you're not always going to be able to. Meanwhile, I could show my son Final Fantasy VI and nobody's going to take it from me. It's not even online. So, <laughs> you know, it's just how, how it is. So, yeah, I encourage everyone to just look into this and understand what you're getting into. And... You know, it, as things develop, we have ways forward. I think we just need to make sure that we're right there. We're letting people know as much as we can. You know, obviously, this isn't okay. We need more access. There needs to be um, legislation. I think Wendell brought up the, was it the first sale doctrine? I yeah. believe he brought up. So uh, he couldn't be on this episode with us, um, but he brought that up. And, and, and I agree because it's like, we need something like that to protect the consumer that, you know, there, there's, there's something there, there needs to be more responsibility. Yeah. So. Well, we have for sale doctrine for books. It just doesn't translate as well to some of the current right. media. So it's one of those things that need to be um, brought back up. So I believe it was in, was it 1850s? I think it was the copyright infringement first sale doctrine was drafted. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been, it's been around for a long time because these, these problems aren't new. There was problems with books in the early days in, you know, 150 years later. Now we just 
said, oh, wait, digital media is something completely different. There's, as if we got to start over and we really don't. It is still the content someone has created. Maybe the packaging has changed, but it still has the general same feel of that. You know, the it's a movie, not a book, but same concept as well. We've seen to kind of make sure that these get interpreted well and protect the consumer interest because it wasn't by accident that that was written. It was because of the problems that were created back in the 1800s that led to it. It's, there was probably not a podcast about it then, but you know, there was a bunch of people in a bar arguing about this, I'm sure. And they're talking about how uh, copying the book is, is stealing. Apparently, yeah, exactly. Or if they even cared anyway, or you know, or just don't copy that floppy. You know, that's 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 where I remember seeing anti piracy messages for the first time. Don't copy that floppy. Don't and me even back then, I'm like, of course I'm going to copy that floppy. I don't know how good that floppy is going to last. I want like backup copies of that floppy. I want like ten copies of that game. I paid money for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but um, yeah, here we are. So yeah, you know where to find us. Uh, obviously, Tom, you know, your channel, my yep. channel. Joe, is your channel live or did I just spill something? <laughs> Coming shortly. Coming shortly? Coming well, we shortly. can find you at Tuxcare, though, for now. Yeah, I mean, you can find me at Tuxcare. Yeah, uh, and unless you add another place to find you. So obviously, yep. people know where to find me because they're already there. So You're already here. They're already here. <laughs> so let us... Just put in the comments what you thought of this, you know, to see if this is, uh, we should bring up topics like this and, you know, maybe ha have guests on to talk about it randomly and um, maybe it'll be fun. But in the meantime, though, thank you guys for joining me. Really appreciate that. And everyone that's uh, live streaming and also watching after the fact, I appreciate you as well. So thank you. in the meantime, don't copy that floppy or copy it responsibly. So Copy responsibly. <laughs> there we go. Copy responsibly. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks.